Hey everyone, this is Dr. Emily Sterning with American Resiliency here with an up-to-date 2050 climate forecast for all of our friends in Ohio. I know a number of adaptation and resilience professionals getting ready for our climate future in Ohio. Bethany, extra good vibes to you and your crew in Columbus. Let me tell you, there are real investments being made in this state's infrastructure and you'll see why. This updated Ohio outlook has some significant changes from our last one with important information for anyone interested in Ohio's climate future, even if you think you know what to expect. Just so you know where to find my source material, this forecast is based on the National Climate Assessment, which was just updated. We received the fifth National Climate Assessment in November of 23. There have been significant changes in the projections in this new edition. I'm updating the outlooks for every state. If you wanna follow along with me, as an easy cheat, go to chapters down to all figures. That'll let you find the figure that I refer to by number easily so you can zoom in and look at what's going on right where you live. I use the fifth national climate assessment for these forecasts because it represents the highest consensus climate science available. Your tax dollars paid for the development and review of this document. You deserve access to the information. Today, we're breaking this down for Ohio. FYI, American Resiliency is the only nonprofit focused on communicating this important information to the public. Let's get rolling. The conditions I'm modeling for 2050, we're talking about regularly hitting 2C as a global temperature increase. That seems like our most likely climate future. People still talk about 1.5, but we have blown through the margin for that. Unfortunately, the reality is that we're gonna be dealing with change Let's check that out with a national figure, looking at changes at 2C, figure 1.14. We can see here that Ohio is in the moderate change band, looking at an increase of four to five degrees F by 2050, but that doesn't tell us much, right? Let's learn more about how that's gonna fall seasonally over the course of the year. Here in figure 2.11, we can get a lot more information looking at changes in extremes across the nation. You can see just at a glance that Ohio is looking at some big changes, some interesting changes. Just at a glance, it looks like we're seeing bands within the state of higher projected summer change. Look over there at hot days, and at warm nights, there's some conserved brighter bands. We'll zoom in and get a closer look at that. They appear to be very closely aligned. So we're gonna get you an ID on where to expect these like super summer type increases. Those bands indicate how many extra days of potentially dangerous temperatures you're facing with potentially dangerous wet bulb heat. Looking at the winter, just a glance from this national view, you can see a big drop in cold almost the entire state Looks like almost a month less of cold days, of days below freezing across much of Ohio, almost the entire state of Ohio. Let's get some more details. Zooming in on additional days over 95, it looks like who's getting hot? Cincinnati and Columbus, you're getting hot. Looks like about two additional weeks of super summer heading your way. We're talking about potentially dangerous high temperatures. We're talking about needing air conditioning, like not a luxury, a health need. Good news, Cleveland, you're looking to avoid that level of dangerous heat up, particularly on the eastern side of the city. Looks like a very mild summer increase. You're still seeing some increases in nighttime heat. Let's zoom over to the nighttime heat map. You can see this is a different figure that we're looking at here. This is a zoom in on Ohio in increased nights over 70 degrees. You can see that even up by Cleveland, there's some increase in nighttime heat. Those nights over 70, they're difficult in an urban environment. You get a severe urban heat island effect where the concrete holds the heat and the city can't really cool down. But I know there are some smart folks who have bet on Cleveland over Cincinnati and Columbus for real estate investment. I'm happy to say Cleveland is looking like a good investment in Ohio in these projections. In all of Ohio's major cities, though, we're going to need resilient access to power by 2050. We're going to need reliable air conditioning in all three of those. Cleveland is looking the least vulnerable to heat stress of those big three population centers. Let's talk more about the winter change, though. Zooming in on Ohio in that loss of cold map, where we're talking about how many days below freezing you're going to lose, Almost all of Ohio is losing a month of days below freezing. Let's get another look at what that means in terms of plant hardiness zones. That'll let us look not just at the change in duration of winter, but in the degree of change in winter lows. All right, looking at figure 11.3, which is a long figure, we're gonna focus on present day climate normals and mid-century projections. 
you can see at a glance that we're looking at change from mostly a zone six across Ohio to zone seven verging on zone eight. That's a big change by mid-century. If you look at where you start to get that peach color that we see emerging in Ohio by mid-century today, we're going to be looking down at like Southern Virginia. We're gonna be looking at the border between Tennessee and Kentucky. That's a big geographic difference and it may occur to you there's some mountains in between there, right? So this is gonna be a substantial landscape transformation. It's a full zone shift over almost all of Ohio, a big heat up, going from a Midwestern winter to like a Memphis-like winter, a real change in character from a Midwestern climate to seriously a Southern type climate for Ohio. That size of a change, the landscape transformation work you'll need to do in Ohio, it's gonna to need to be very deliberate. You almost need to visualize a sort of garden approach to landscape transformation. You'll need to help new plant species get to the area. And some of your current ecosystems are going to have a hard time. There's a lot of stress in these projections hitting the Wayne National Forest. I would highlight Wayne National Forest as a forest very vulnerable in the east to mass tree death and to wildfire. Let's look at figure 7.4 and check that out. Looking at this figure 7.4, we can see that in Ohio, in the Wayne National Forest, we're looking at maybe up to a 300% increase in conditions where very large wildfires could occur. They used to be extremely rare. On these new models, we're looking at conditions ripe for a major wildfire once or twice a decade now without intervention. That's a big change when you used to be talking about maybe once in 100 years. So personal observation, I drove through the Wayne National Forest on the 33 in the summer of 22, going on the 33 to hit the 77. On that trip, I did see evident visual signs of mass tree stress that could lead to mass tree death, the sort of conditions that led to massive wildfires throughout the American West already. As you saw on the fire map, the danger is projected to be lower to the eastern side of the mountains, and visually, I did observe a dramatic visual improvement in forest health as we moved through Ohio into West Virginia. West Virginia's forests were looking much better, much less stressed. It's challenging. Let's talk about precipitation, though. We need to talk about precipitation to visualize the potential landscape transformation we could be facing with this level of seasonal change. Let's look at figure 210. We can see here in 210 that Ohio is looking at crosshatch, statistically significant increases in precipitation by 2050, looking at about 10%, and that outlook is stable at 2C, our most likely future, or look down there in the corner at 3C, also 10% increase in precipitation. This is good news in terms of our infrastructure work. That means that we can have some faith that the flood planning we do here will be useful generations out. And we do expect some increase in loss from flooding in Ohio, looking pretty bad north of Columbus. Let's check that out. This is a zoom in on figure 110 when we're looking at percentage change in average annual loss from flooding as we move towards mid-century. We can see that Ohio's outlook is one of the more challenging in the Midwest, but contrast that to like your entire eastern seaboard, it doesn't look so bad. But let's look at what's going on. What's causing these areas of particularly intense flooding in Ohio? When I lined the county level map up with this county level map of your major rivers, looks like the Mohican River wants to really cause a lot of trouble. But when we get further into it, it looks like in figure 212, a lot of your flooding is going to be related to changes in precipitation extremes at two degrees, to huge amounts of water being dumped on you, in particularly intense storms. Zooming in on the total precipitation on heaviest 1% of days, we can see some areas where we expect to see really quite sizable increases in the amount of water dumped per storm. Zooming out a little bit, easily talking about 20-30%. If we look at your five-year maximum daily precipitation, so like where are the biggest storms going to be, we see a real hot spot emerging over Toledo, right? Overall, there's a lot of state-level variability you saw there, and you should look at that figure for yourself and see what's going on where you are. But the big picture is that flooding-type deluges look more likely in the greater Cincinnati area, as well as around Toledo, particular precipitation hotspot, with less dramatic, but still like serious, increases in precipitation 
around Cleveland and Columbus. So more rain everywhere, worse in Cincinnati, not as bad in Cleveland and Columbus. Taking another look at water, let's look at the groundwater. This is figure 2412. I feel like it's worth noting, Ohio has a lot of groundwater going on, multiple groundwater systems. Now, pollution's a problem in Ohio, as we would expect from any state with an industrial history. There have been algal blooms in Lake Erie that have knocked out city water supplies. It took out the water to Toledo in 2014. It's a problem. And the fact that summers are going to be warmer all across the state, you're looking at a minimum of additional five days over 95 across the entire state. It's going to make algal blooms more likely. But water is life. In Ohio, you have water. I mean, check this out. From the lakes and the rivers, from the increased precipitation in the forecast, from this stratified groundwater systems in Ohio, it's really meaningful how much water you have because there are serious drought trends projected for many parts of the country. You know, you're also likely to experience increased summer drought. We've talked about a lot of challenges in Ohio. And cleaning up the water system isn't exactly a low stress problem for Ohio, but we need to take a minute to really look at the potential here too. The change in climate Ohio is going to experience is one of the biggest in the nation. You're really shifting away from a Midwestern climate very much towards a classic Southern climate. That's gonna be hard on the landscape. The flooding outlook is challenging. It's the most expensive flood projection in the region, but you will have water. On a national landscape, you're gonna have a shorter dangerous temperature system than many places to the South, both the Southeast and the Southwest, where water is gonna be a major, major issue. And Ohio has a lot of infrastructure that's kind of operating below capacity, right? You have a lot of infrastructure that's ready for investment, a lot of housing stock that's ready for a tune-up, a lot of places where people could live and they're gonna need places to live. You're high change in Ohio. This is a high change outlook. However, it's undeniable that you are also high capacity. And that's a rare pair as we look towards 2050. There's a lot of work to do here to get ready, but you're gonna have help. People will come to Ohio and working on building resilience against flooding working on building towards clean water infrastructure with wetlands restoration, with green floodplain projects. People will be coming to work. And these are the kinds of work you'll need to protect your communities and build resilience. These water projects, water investments are gonna be so important for your future, for continuing to support what I suspect will be an increasing population. These are big projects, but Ohio has done big projects before. Ohio used to be a major contributor to emissions. The state peaked at number four in the nation in terms of emissions per capita, but the state has done so much work on the grid because of the resilience potential in your outlook. The work done to convert away from coal has been amazing in Ohio. Ohio is on track for solar to overtake coal. Ohio has shown a potential for positive change. And there's a lot of change to handle here. I mean, with increased fire threat, increased water challenges, and substantial increases in dangerous heat in some of your major population centers. Even when you're facing all of that, you need to stay aware of your potential because Ohio, while you might be facing about the highest rate of change in the Midwest, you're pretty neck and neck with Michigan, you have this deep richness. You have a deep richness in water, and speaking as an island, you have pretty good soil. So when you look at your potential, particularly when we consider the expected impacts to population centers on the East Coast, you should see that from a national perspective, it's not only going to be possible to handle Ohio's challenges, the relative level of change on the national level is an opportunity. People are going to need new homes, and Ohio, even with this level of change, should be viewed as a probable destination. There is hope, and what hope we can grow will be based on our preparations. We can prepare for what's coming and do our best to build a good future. Let's get ready. Folks, thanks for listening in. And I'd also like to thank all of the donors and volunteers who contribute to American Resiliency. If you are interested in giving, please check out the donation link on our About page on the YouTube channel or go to our website, www.americanresiliency.org. We are a registered 501c3. If you send us direct donations, they are tax deductible. Thanks to the generosity of this community and both funding and time, we've really been able to step up the quality of our videos for these updated forecasts. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for being here with me. Let's get ready together.